starts already? Well, I'm Klaus Heinz from Head Audio. I'm here today to talk about our new uh, tower main system, which is an active and modular and most complete solution for the best possible sound. There were a, a number of uh, non-standard design goals here. One is to have a totally symmetric approach to get the best in sound dispersion. And second, to have a closed system, a non-ported system that has all the power and the dynamics that in earlier times came from the big main uh, monitors in the big studios. These normally were 12, 15, maybe even 18 inch uh, woofers that were ported and that developed very high dynamical capabilities that, uh, that um, intrigued the people who had a chance to listen to it, like me. And I wanted to tame this power to control it with a closed system that has a more ideal uh, uh, impulse response and yet was possible to play loud and uh, only very little limited, limited in the dynamical, from a dynamical point of view. So what we did in the end was a modular system with two subwoofers, one on the bottom, one on top, and a symmetrical main unit. Um, another thing I observed was to have a reasonable distribution of active diaphragm areas across frequency. So to combine a big subwoofer with a small uh, tweeter only may have a linear frequency response but will not be able to do a good mid-range. And so we have a, dis a distribution of different uh, drive units that uh, should fulfill the demand of a homogeneous sound over frequency, not only in the frequency response sense of the word, but in energy response across frequency as well. Besides completing the speaker, of course, uh, we make the tweeters by ourselves. We see Tatiana here, who is a watchmaker and has all the precision and all the sensitivity to, to rein these diaphragms. From the experience, I have to say that the tweeter is a little bit of a diva. It, if you make them the same way, you will not get the same results always. Sometimes one has to look after it. Um, we have a test box, each and every tweeter is tested and compared to the reference curve. And sometimes we do have alterations that are difficult to understand and maybe even more difficult to repair, but of course we do that. Folding the diaphragm is an, a manual task. Each and every fold is folded manually and uh, realigned. There is a certain bars on the diaphragm that allow to realign after each, every fold the right position. To start with a tweeter that is a classical air motion transformer, uh, not uh, very classical as the original work of Oscar Heil was a very bulky and big tweeter. I, like even 30 years ago, started to do compact versions of the air motion transformer here in Berlin. And this is the newest uh, and most evolved standard that I, we have to offer. It is a, a air motion transformer that goes down to nearly two kilohertz, which is practical from, uh, for low crossover points, which help musical natural reproduction. Um, we have two four inches here and two seven inches. Subwoofers carry four active drivers each, so on the back side you have the same appearance as from the front side. All of them have 300 watt amplifiers each, and so all in all, with eight subwoofers and 2.4 kilowatts of power, you really can have low energy in big quantities. We are uh, at the working place here for tower mains. We have here one of the subwoofers that are prepared for the Munich High End Show. Uh, one thing that helped the design of the tower mains uh, very much uh, is the development of new and more powerful PWM amplifiers. The, uh, 
This is a two times 600 watt amplifier with a 1200 watt power supply. And the technical data of that unit match those of the finest audiophile power amplifiers available today. To give just one figure, the distortions up to 500 watts over the complete frequency band are 0.005%. And uh, so we do not have to hide at all <laughs> in the audiophile area. And the special goodie, of course, of all that is that we have a direct connection from the amplifier to the um, subwoofers. So all the uh, damping factor, factor is preserved and uh, all losses that necessarily are introduced by coils, capacitors and resistors are completely avoided. I think this is a big advantage. The drive units have been uh, optimized to go to very low frequencies, even in small cabinets. The volumes they do have is not overwhelming, of course. So uh, the correction, the equalization that has to be made only needs very few dBs to go down to 20 Hertz with a minus three dB point. It's a push-pull, a parallel push-pull uh, uh, alignment. So the, the impulses compensate for each other. The cabinets are calm. And uh, for the equalization, there is a special remark necessary because in theory, the uh, closed systems can have an ideal impulse response and tube systems cannot have, uh, cannot have that. So a few years, like 10 years ago, a German uh, engineer who is very well known in the do-it-yourself area and is uh, Siegfried Linkwitz. Uh, some people might have heard the Linkwitz Riley filters or in this case, uh, the Linkwitz transform. And the Linkwitz transform is a kind of equalization for subwoofers that wor works for the closed systems only and that not equalizes the system in the classical sense, but works with two steps. The first step neutralizes the electrodynamic uh, properties of the woofer in that cabinet, that is Q factor and um, F0, F uh, cutoff frequency. Though then the subwoofer in a way is innocent, has no properties anymore. And upon that, a target function is applied that leads to the desired response and impulse response. So one can design independently from, from the properties of the woofer what, what one wants to get. It's not a little bit equalizing here or there, but a more principled approach that delivers the ideal system response. And uh, if one has that many woofers and that much power, one can have a very good response without noise, without resonances, and very high output uh, nevertheless. That's the approach for that kind of woofers. Here we have the filter section for the subwoofer unit. It contains uh, the already mentioned Linkwitz transform filter. It uh, contains um, a high pass filter, of co uh, course, a low pass filter as well. So, uh, do you see this is an um, a analog filter, uh, which is uh, built here in Berlin as well. And Kevin is going to insert it into the subwoofer. Um, and later on it will be connected to the power amplifier we just saw. These are subwoofers which have an enormous uh, amplitude that have a linear area of 16 millimeters which if you see it working at very low frequencies is, is near too jolly. Yeah. <laughs> For those interested in the field these units deliver from the volume of air that can move a little bit more than an 18-inch subwoofer ported. They are closed, they are missing this additional area of the port, but so you have an idea what we are aiming at, real dynamical reproduction. Are you trying to pitch this to sell this new model exclusively into recording studios? or are you selling this to the domestic listener as well? When I design, I don't sell. <laughs> so what I wanted to do was a, uh, a most, the most accurate speaker we could make 
that was able to develop high dynamics. Dynamics is an underestimated field in, in loudspeakers, I think. E everybody who has once listened to a good big system and switches to a small system with the same frequency response and nice behavior always misses something. It sounds poor and st stuffed and boxy and although it's the same frequency response, so there's a certain majesty that big systems do have and that intrigues the listener positively. So this was to combine the properties of the majesty, if I may say it that way, and yet have a, a reasonable volume and good dispersion characteristics. The big old monitors did have very bad dispersion uh, characteristics. That was bad for, for the accuracy of the response and was bad for the listening positions. The sound was very different if you was one meter at the left or the right from the sweet spot. This has uh, much better properties in so far. And uh, so it is the best speaker we can do. Of course, there is a, it's a discussion about pro audio and home speakers since decades. And uh, even in my previous work in Adam, I always emphasized on the, on the fact that we think in good and bad speakers. We do not think in pro audio and high end speakers. Um, what the audiophile people claim is accuracy and reproduction, often called high fidelity, right? That's what it means. And um, so the goal as such evidently is the same. In practice, it turns out that uh, the high-end systems sometimes are more friendly. And it turns out that the high-end people say, well, this monitor is too cold or colder than I like, would be the more exact answer. And uh, we try to not to think in adjectives, like in attributes like uh, cold, warm, soft, hard, but to think in accuracy and non-accuracy. And if the accuracy is obtained, then somebody who maybe is inclined to have a background music is intrigued because it's too clear what he's going to hear. But this is not in a perspective that we uh, look at. We try to be accurate and the, the the, uh, the dimension and the, the form of this loudspeaker and its accuracy certainly will be welcome in both uh, in both groups. And whether it will be more the high-end people or more the pro audio people, we have to find out. We will offer it to both communities and we'll see what we get as a reaction. This is, a, from my point of view, a fabulous 9-inch uh, driver that uh, you find in the subwoofer uh, of the system. It has a um, very high linear excursion area. That means it can move a lot of air. As you can see, it is, a, is a, a capable of going long ways uh, from peak to peak, uh, thus enabling the high SPL that we are looking at. More generally speaking, small volumes and big woofers are a dangerous combination. They might have the frequency response you want to get, but you need to equalize them a lot, which limits dynamics to come back to the issue. It, is, uh, it was a goal here to have uh, TILA small parameters. These are the properties of uh, the woofer that determine its behavior in small volumes, to make these in a way that even with a small volume, you do not have to equalize it a lot. So these are, by nature, 6 dB downs at 20 Hz, although they are on the small volume. So the correction area is just 3 dB, not more. And this helps to transfer all the power to air, uh, SPL, which is good. I mentioned that already for dynamics. <laughs> when uh, good speakers evolved like 30, 40 years ago, then there were these big monitors with all the dynamic capabilities mentioned already. However, if you would have heard a single violin or a single female voice from that monitor, from the day's point of view, that was awful. It was um, offensive and, and not enjoyable. <laughs> uh, so uh, the hi-fi speakers in the beginning tried to impress with, with a lot of bass and, that, uh, and a lot of high-end, so they had a, a, a non-linear frequency response sometimes. And both kind of people um, uh, pointed to the other ones saying this is ridiculous what you do and uh, we are having the whole truth and nothing but the truth.
Still today, uh, if a sound engineer wants to say something especially nasty about a speaker, he says it sounds like hi-fi. <laughs> so, but they are, is not true since decades already. The good hi-fi speakers have learned to be neutral, to have accuracy and to, to run after the same uh, uh, goal or to, to have a good speaker in the universal sense of the word. The both groups have approached, uh, have, have become nearer to each other. That's my uh, experience at least. Yeah. What we do have here are the amplifiers and the filters for the TM80, for the uh, middle uh, speaker or the main speaker of the whole assembly. And it is divided in a power supply 300 watt amplifier combination here. Two more 300 watt amplifiers for mid and highs. And this is a two PCB filter board that allows to get the right sound out of the different drive units. When you're developing a speaker, how do you determine then if it is accurate or not? Yeah, <laughs> that was the more principal questions in our business. Um, besides the speakers, the measurement uh, equipment has evolved an awful lot. New algorithms, new tricks have been found to measure frequency responses and distortions in normal rooms. So each and every engineer who is interested can measure what the speaker uh, R&D history has to offer. Uh, besides frequency response, there are five or ten more curves or parameters that you can measure. And all these measurements have the common goal to avoid mistakes. Mistakes measured on what has uh, shown to be reasonable. It is reasonable to have a good horizontal and a less, inter uh, less broad vertical dispersion. It has uh, proven that one should observe the mem uh, diaphragm area versus frequency. That means not a huge woofer and a small woofer and a small tweeter, but to have then a three-way system if the tweeter only can uh, start from like three, four kilohertz. And there are uh, other uh, measurements and attitudes that have proven to be good for the speaker sound. So um, this, to, and to see what one does, measurements are uh, of course necessary and each and everybody who is going to uh, develop a speaker should be familiar what these results could mean in reality. Looking at graphs and numbers is a big invitation, especially if it is nice, gra nice graphs in different colors with a nice background. It doesn't tell you at all how the speaker sounds. So one way of arguments is fine. I don't make mistakes on what is known today to be observed for good speakers. In the reverse opinion, is not only less possible, it is not at all possible. From a frequency response, nobody, even the most experienced listener or engineer, can tell you how it sounds. And this is not a kind of joke or a nice remark, it is really true and you have no other chance than to have experienced listeners who judge what you have done in the end. The subjective domain prevails in the last meters for the, for the goal by far the objective domain, which I would call the measurements and, and the numbers that you can obtain. So it's, it stays a kind of business that is very human. In the end you need your friends and your own ears uh, and the experience of, of musically experienced people um, to have a final judgment. Let me add. Sorry, let let sorry. me add. Yeah, sorry. Let me add one thing. Um, so, as the judgment is a subjective one in the end, the question is, how can I be sure to have done the right thing? And my beloved word for it is, you have to wait for the canon of the people out there. That means, if you have made a good speaker, that turns out from the reactions you get from different people in different countries. And if this canon is a good one, then the success is there, then you can claim to have made a very good speaker. If you, by some bad accident, have made a not so good speaker, you will know two, three months after you have sent it out <laughs> to, to, to the engineers, to the customers, to the distributors, 
then you will learn. Nah, hmm, ha. And the, and the statistical opinion of experienced people, that is the objective measure, although it consists of subjective judgments only. This is not a, a sequence, but it takes place in parallel all the time. If the first prototype is switched on, if you have a new driver, then as an experienced guy, you rather quick know whether this is a gifted uh, driver or whether it's not. And you always have a certain volume and a certain diameter. So if you have gone through that like 20, 50 times, then you know rather quick whether it's a gifted child or where they have to change things principally. And uh, in the end, if a linear frequency response in a one meter distance is a very good orientation to have a balanced sound, no question. For example, if you have a, a, big, a bigger woofer and a smaller tweeter, as mentioned before, then in the mid-range you might choose a different response from when you compared to when you have a three-way system where the energy because of the bigger dispersion of the mid-range in, in that frequency area automatically leave, uh, delivers a more different sound impression from the from within a room with all the reflections and of course this, these are longer issues and um, in the end it is uh, one maximum 2 dB uh, deviation that you introduced to avoid a harshness that is in the system or to lift a, uh, a mid-range to make it right to the point and not weak and not too friendly to have this average or objective success that you are looking for. How do you measure the dynamic capabilities of a speaker? This is one of my favorite issues because it is not solved. <laughs> when I switch from the big box to the small box the effect is so evidently that from an engineering point of view I have to say of course I can measure that. You know what? I cannot. I have tried a few uh, approaches. I'm talking with the technical university here to give some more uh, students uh, statistical works. Astoundingly enough if you would increase the, the input voltage by say two volts and you would have a 60B increase, expect in 60B increase, then you get it, even from the small box. And I have no good idea, still not a good idea, of how to measure objectively the dynamic behavior of speakers. I'm very proud, I'm, I'm very sad to say that, but <laughs> it's the case, yeah. If you have a high efficient speaker, it is more vivid, more transparent, if all the other properties may be the same. And if you have a low efficiency, it's a little bit muddy and slow and not so interesting. And uh, yet again, uh, please look around in the world, talk to other engineers and let me know how we can measure dynamics. Mm -hmm.